Good evening to everyone and welcome to today's session. <clears throat> Today we have, can you increase the volume, three main topics for discussion, myopia, trachoma and uh, anatomy. Generally it is a tradition to start uh, with anatomy, but uh, why we have not started because we are going according to most commonly asked topic towards the least commonly asked. But still in anatomy, we need to have a quick review of uh, starting from conjunctiva until retina. One round of what all that we studied in ophthalmology. <coughs> we welcome our online students, Dr. Renuka, Nina, then Mandya, Raipur, Karnul, Tirupati and uh, all the other students online. So let's make the start. <clears throat> is the voice clear? Please uh, find out. Is the voice, uh, you checked it before? Can you, can you slightly increase the voice? <clears throat> yeah. Myopia is that short sightedness which is the refractive error where when the lights when the parallel rays of the light emerge, they come from infinity and they are focused in front of the retina instead of falling on the retina. So that is typically the myopia. So this is a normal eye where uh, the light rays which are coming are, uh, uh, this, this is the myopia corrected eye which is equal to normal. The light rays are falling on the retina, whereas in this case, <clears throat> the light rays are falling in front of the retina, which is the underlying problem. Now, what is the etiology of myopia? <clears throat> we have axial myopia, where there is an increase in the anterior posterior length of the eyeball, which is the underlying commonest cause. Then we have curvatural myopia which is because of the increased curvature of the cornea. Then we have positional myopia, which is because of the improper positioning of the crystalline lens in the eye. Then index myopia, any condition which increases the refractive index, like nuclear sclerosis, can lead to the development of myopia. Then any excessive accommodation because of the spasm of accommodation. Can you give me one scenario where we have seen there is a spasm of ciliary muscles and spasm of accommodation? Uveitis. In uveitis, why do we give atropine? Basically to relieve the spasm of the ciliary muscle. So any ciliary muscle spasm also is responsible for the development of uh, myopia. So. What is the common commonness for all this? Everywhere it is increase. Increased diameter, increased refractive index, increased uh, spasm. So simply you need to remember increase is equal to myopia. So this is a typical example of an eyeball which is typically elongated posteriorly on the equator and hence an increased uh, axial length is responsible for the pathological myopia. Any condition that leads to the degeneration of the sclera, which can increase the length of the eyeball, can lead to the development of pathological myopia. Now what are the various clinical varieties of myopia? We have Dr. Kavi, Dr. Sakshi, Dr. Mandya, etc., etc., who have a, who are the part of our glorious Communion, I am very happy today we touched 40 online viewers. I am waiting when we will touch full century, 100 plus viewers without traveling anywhere, sitting in the home, can be able to attend a live interactive session, stop the teacher from progressing if they don't understand, answer the questions of the teacher and ask the teacher. So that is the beautiness of the modernity of the internet. So, congenital myopia, we have a simple or a developmental myopia 
pathological myopia and acquired myopia are the various varieties is what need to be remembered <clears throat> did you change the speakers or they are the same speakers okay <clears throat> now in acquired myopia we have a post traumatic post keratitic drug induced pseudo myopia space myopia night myopia consecutive myopia etc etc now few comments about each of them congenital myopia what is the common age group where we discover it doctor age group is very important we have seen congenital glaucoma at what age congenital glaucoma appear at what age congenital myopia appear so the word says congenital infantile they need not appear at birth congenital myopia it is usually diagnosed by the age of 2 to 3 years most of the time the error is unilateral and hence it manifests as anisometropia and usually the error by the time the child reaches an age of about 8 to 10 it will become constant then because of this myopia what problem the child can develop there can be development of a convergent squint in order to preferentially see clearly the far point the child will go into convergent squint because of the myopia now there can be some uh, other congenital errors which can lead to the development of congenital myopia especially any cataract any iridia microphthalmos megalocornea or a congenital retinal detachment any of them can be the predisposing factors for the development of the congenital myopia is what you need to remember now comes the favorite mcq of the examiner what is the commonest variety of the myopia simple or a developmental myopia is the commonest variety is what we need to basically remember <clears throat> so should sure, no are the problem with the local speakers or uh, are the students able to listen correctly is is the clarity of the voice is there yeah okay you need to apologize uh, a bit of my evolving sore throat i was praying but i should not have until november i was praying god that uh, after november you give me 2 to 3 months of sore throat no issue but uh, god doesn't listen so maybe another couple of days i my voice become more brassy like a laryngotracheobronchitis uh, but still uh it's a question of stamina so we tell students whether you have fever whether you don't have mood whether you are post night duty come to the class so the same rule applies for the teacher also so simple myopia typically a physiological error without any associated other disease in the eye you call it as simple myopia if you have five year old children in a classroom two out of the 100 will have it by 15 years about 14% of children will be developing simple myopia why do you call simple myopia school myopia it is the other name which is being given for it because in the school going age between 8 years to 12 years lot of children develop myopia hence it is called as school myopia is what need to be uh, basically remember it now <clears throat> if both the parents are myopic if both the parents are doctors what is the chance of the son becoming a hospital administrator he will discover that instead of becoming doctor if i start a hospital and employ doctors i learn more money so if both parents are myopic chance is 20% then uh, 
if one of the parent is myopic the chance is 10% if no parents are carrying a spectacles and the child getting myopia is 5% so school going myopia is the classical simple myopia is what need to be remembered so naturally the poor vision to the distant objects is the main symptom that's the reason they become class first why there is nothing attractive far away so they will have better focus on the books so poor vision for distance then there will be asthenopic symptoms of uh, tiredness of the eye is another important feature then half shutting of the eyes to achieve a greater clarity of asthenopic vision is another important presenting feature then uh, what are the classical clinical signs that you see it is an increase in the axial length of the eyeball that's the reason all the meenakshi seshadris in the class with big eyes prominent eyeballs have a risk of developing myopia if you look at anterior chamber it will be more deeper than normal pupils are somewhat larger and uh, sluggishly reacting now comes a favorite mcq of the examiner how is the fundus in myopia simple myopia fundus is normal if the fundus is abnormal if you find any crescents or a poster fugue spots or lacquers uh, um, uh, spots then uh, it is pathological myopia so fundus is normal in case of simple myopia many times this question comes as an mcq in the exam how is the fundus what is your confident answer fundus is normal because it is simple myopia then if you look at the magnitude of the refractive error in a simple myopia it is usually seen between 5 to 10 years of age and it keeps exceeding until about 18 to 20 years of age at a rate of around 0.5 to 5 every year so usually you call it as simple myopia means never the refractive error exceeds 6 to 2 6 to 8 points another favorite mcq of the examiner simple myopia cannot exceed 6 to 8 is what you need to remember now how do you diagnose doctor you will be doing retinoscopy basically to diagnose <clears throat> now if you take a plane mirror in retinoscopy at a working distance of 1 meter how will be the movement of the reflex is one of the common questions the movement of the reflex if it is in the same direction as the movement of the mirror if it is uh, a plane mirror then it can be a normal person hypermetropic or a myopia less than one diopter if the reflex moves in the opposite direction then the myopia is more than one diameter it does not move at all then myopia is equal to one diopter if you use a concave mirror if the reflex moves in the same direction then myopia is more than one diameter if it moves in opposite direction then it can be a normal person or hypermetropic or the myopia less than one diopter if at all an mcq comes which is a tough question in myopia means only about retinoscopy finding 100% you should answer confidently in the tomorrow's exam of course why will it move same side opposite side if we start uh, physics it's little longer but since uh, we are supposed to be a quick uh, comprehensive summating summarizing session i am really not going much deep into it now pathological myopia after simple myopia it is rapidly progressive it typically starts at the age of 5 to 10 years by the time they are into their early adult life at all sense they will develop high myopia and often it is associated with the degenerative changes in the eye which makes it a pathological myopia is what need to be remembered 
So why does this pathological myopia develop? Any rapid growth of the eye, axial growth. Normally it is a biological phenomenon, our eyeball size keep increasing. But if it is very rapid, then that leads to development of pathological myopia. So what are the presenting features? A defective vision. They can also have night blindness. Why night blindness? Often pathological myopia is associated with the degenerative changes in the retina. And because of that, the rods and cones, the photoreceptors also are affected. Hence, night blindness is an associated feature of the pathological myopia. Musque bullitantus is another classical feature of the pathological myopia. What does it mean? The floating black opacities in the front of the eyes is a classical feature. Anybody who have a degenerated liquefied vitreous as the underlying problem in a pathological myopia, they will develop musque volitantis. Then what are the important clinical signs of pathological myopia? We have prominent eyeballs, elongation more on the posterior pole. Posterior pole is much more elongated. Cornea is very large, anterior chamber is very deep. Pupils are large and reacting sluggishly. So the, all these things are seen even in the case of simple myopia. But what is important is pathological changes if you do fundus examination. This is one of the favorite MCQ of the examiner. What are all the fundus changes in pathological myopia? First, optic disc. If you see the optic disc, it appears large and pale and along its temporal edge, you have a nasal one temporal edge, na? temporal edge there is a characteristic myopic crescent, classical feature. There can be a prepapillary crescent which is encircling the disc. There can be a supertraction crescent where the retina is being pulled along the disc margin, optic disc margin. Now let us see. This is an example of a peripapillary crescent. You are able to see the crescent? Peripapillary crescent is one of the important changes. So if you look at uh, the optic disc doctor, this is a typical pictorial of how a temporal myopic crescent is seen. Then you can have Poster fugue spots and there can be degeneration of the macula around the peripapillary area. So, macular degeneration and peripapillary degeneration is what you come across. Then, there can be peripheral degeneration of the retina. Retina is being divided into broadly temporal area which is more out, outer side and a nasal retina, right? Then uh, the retina which is towards the optic disc is more central, other part which is towards aura serrata is called more peripheral. Peripheral degeneration of the retina can occur and that can lead to the development of what you can see. The retinal detachment is one of the important consequence. Then as you can see here, there can be a pathological myopic crescent which can develop. Now doctor, what are the degenerative changes you see in uh, choroid and the retina? There can be white atrophic patches in the macula. Then what is meant by foster fugue spot? Typically there can be a red circular patch in the retina which is because of the neovascularization in the subretinal space and the presence of a hemorrhage into the choroid. Below the retina, who is there? Choroid. So, choroidal hemorrhage and subretinal neovascularization will lead to posterior view spot. And it is typically located at the area where the macula is located, that part of the retina. Then there can be cystoid degeneration and a point of time total retinal atrophy can occur. Now, once more, if you do a fluorescent angiography, 
because of the subretinal neovascularization in the macular area, you are able to see the presence of uh, the poster fugue spot, which is one of the very classical feature. Similarly, the lacquer cracks is another important uh, feature. Then that posterior elongation of the sclera will lead to what is called posterior staphyloma, which can occur in case of pathological myopia. So that ectasia of the sclera along the posterior pole is another important feature. Then there can be a vitreous detachment which can occur at a point of time. Then what are the important visual field uh, changes because of this retinal degeneration? There can be ring scotoma which can develop. And if you do ERG, then you can be able to demonstrate electroretinogram, that chorioretinal atrophy, which is seen in pathological myopia. Now, what are the complications of the pathological myopia, doctor? A lot of times questions are asked. There can be retinal detachment, complicated cataract, vitreous hemorrhage, choroidal hemorrhage, and there can be a convergent squint, as what you have seen in the earlier case, a convergent squint. Any of them can develop. Now, are there any syndromes associated with pathological myopia? One of the favorite questions of the examiner. Stickler syndrome is what you need to remember. Stickler may, what do you have? A myopia, then primary open angle glaucoma with cataract with vitreoretinal changes along with the mid facial flattening and a small chin. The combination is called the Stickler syndrome is what need to be remembered. So, that is all. The fundus changes, degenerative changes. What are the buzzwords you are not going to forget? Lacquer scratch, poster fugues, posterior staphyloma, and the vitreous degeneration. So, these are the things to be remembered. Now, how do you want to treat myopia? Our physics teacher taught us in the 8th class physics class concave lens are the ones which will make that image falling in front of the retina to move backward and fall on the retina. Then what is the main rule in correction of the myopia? It is opposite to what you do in the case of the hypermetropia. What is that? You need to correct in such a way that minimum acceptance must be provided with maximum vision is the rule. If there is a very high myopia, under correction is always better, is the another important principle that need to be remembered. And uh, why under correction is required? Because if you fully correct the kind of spectacles that need to be worn by the person will lead to lot of spherical aberrations. And uh, which are intolerable. So, that is the reason under correct the myopia is the rule. And suppose if you need a very high power lens, then contact lens are particularly justified if there is a very high myopia. Now, what are the various surgical options for the management of the myopia doctor? We use a low vision aids which are the ones which are indicated if there is a progressive myopia with the degenerative changes. Then uh, we give genetic counseling and prevent uh, big spectacled uh, first ranker from marrying uh, another big spectacled second ranker in the MD entrance. So genetic counseling has a lot of role. Now what are the various treatment modalities available? We can use spectacles, contact lens or surgery. And in this surgery we can do radial keratotomy. So, fundamentally what we are trying to do by surgical procedures, increased corneal curvature is responsible. Increased axial length is responsible. Somehow you will decrease that length by doing various procedures. One is radial keratotomy. It will give a very good result. But common question asked is, for how many diopters will you do this? Typically, if the myopia is not high grade myopia, 
but low to moderate grade myopia between minus 2 to minus 6 diopters then radial keratotomy has a role lot of times people will be tempted to answer high myopias no radial keratotomy is indicated for low to moderate myopia is what you have to ultimately remember then we use a laser and we do what is called as laser keratomyliosis lasik which is very effective for correcting between minus 6 to minus 30 diopters then photorefractive keratectomy typically is done if the myopia is of the low power minus 2 to minus 6 diopters once more then we can also do automated la lamellar keratectomy ALK which can correct the myopia between minus 6 to minus 32 then the other options which are available is extraction of the lens and uh, intercorneal ring implantation etc etc then what is meant by epi keratophakia basically this is a corneal surgery which is under trial for the correction of the aphakia where uh, 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 we basically prepare a lenticule which is stitched between the donor's cornea onto the surface of the cornea after removing the epithelium in order to alter the corneal diameter is another option which is under uh, trial then keratoplasty corneal transplantation is the other option which is available now comes a favorite question of the examiner what are the indications and contraindications for the LASIK surgery the age of the patient need to be more than 18 refraction must be stable for 18 months myopia must be between minus 1 to minus 20 diopters and the central corneal thickness for doing laser LASIK is should be more than 500 microns and cornea should not be excessively flat so these are the important uh, issues but are there any contraindications to the LASIK doctor typically <clears throat> a monocular patient only one eye any infections glaucoma thin cornea keratoconus diabetic retinopathy dry eye or if there is a poor endothelial reserve of the cornea they become contraindication for LASIK so this is all the summary that you need to remember doctor about myopia so tomorrow when in entrance if they give a question on myopia you are going to blast and what are the difficult things to remember which you should not forget which you should not forget is is it low or a high grade myopia where will you use the uh, surgery radial keratotomy that keratectomy so uh, that's what you need to remember then post fugue spots etc etc then uh, what is the difference between simple and pathological myopia then you are 100% sure on the topic of myopia